I'm Jeffrey Wasserstrom, and I'll be talking about ways to put this man, Xi Jinping, who's been head of the Chinese Communist Party since 2012 and president of the country since 2013, into historical and comparative perspective. When I'm talking, I'll be drawing on material found in two different editions of a book that I co-wrote with Mara Cunningham, China in the 21st Century, What Everyone Needs to Know. The first edition um, that I'll be talking about, the second edition came out in 2013, just as Xi Jinping was taking power. And the new edition, the third, came out just this month. And it's at this moment when Xi Jinping has just been granted the ability to rule longer than the 10 years he was supposed to stay in power, um, potentially staying on uh, throughout his life. So in thinking about how to put Xi Jinping, particularly into historical perspective, I'll be referencing uh, several different periods. That of the Qing Dynasty, China's last um, dynasty, which lasted from 1644 until 1912. The 1911 revolution that put an end to dynastic rule and brought Sun Yat-sen to power. And that began the Republican period. A Republic of China was founded that lasted until 1949. In 1949, another revolution established another new country, the People's Republic of China, which has been in power on the mainland with the Chinese Communist Party in control since 1949. When Xi Jinping took power in 2012, he became head of the Communist Party, which is really where his biggest power lies. But then early in 2013, he became president as well. He was seen as following in a tradition of Communist Party leaders that went back to Mao, who ruled the country from 1949 until his death in 1976. Then after a brief interregnum period by the often now forgotten Hua Guofeng, there were uh, four other leaders, or Xi Jinping was the fourth of these, Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and then Xi. So a lot was thought about how he fit in with this uh, pattern of, of five major leaders uh, since the founding of the new country. But there's also a tendency to break up the People's Republic of China history, to think of a Mao era that's set apart from then the reform era that began in 1979 with Deng Xiaoping's rise. And the tendency really was to think of particularly how Xi Jinping fit in with other reform leaders. Back in 2013, that's how it was thought of. Some contrasts between the two eras was that in Mao's time, the leader was a godlike figure. There was a one-man rule, personality cult, and he criticized harshly Confucianism and capitalism. During the reform era, Leaders became more of a first among equals. Uh, there was more of rule by committee. There was a sense that China needed to move away from charismatic rule, which had sent the, the country off course during the chaos of the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976, and that there should be a more orderly fashion. Um, there was also, under Deng and his successors, an idea that elements of Marxism and Maoism could be combined with elements of capitalism, and that Confucianism, rather than being attacked as feudal, backward thought, should be celebrated as a great Chinese tradition. So there is a clear uh, dividing line in many minds between um, the Mao era and the Reform era, and the question became, where did Xi Jinping fit in among Reform era leaders? Under Mao, there had been um, the godlike status of the leader represented by things like his portrait being everywhere, his book being what everybody had to study. Under Deng Xiaoping, while Deng Xiaoping was clearly the most powerful man in China, there were not images of his, of his picture everywhere. His book was not something that you had to read intensively. Posters of him went up, billboards of him went up, but after his death. His um, thought was elevated to kind of sacred status, but after his death. With his followers, who were the, the successors to him, Hu Jintao and uh, Jiang Zemin before him, and then Hu Jintao, things became even more regularized and even further from being charismatic. Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao both had definite times in power. They were both supposed to rule for 10 years, and after 10 years, they stepped down and passed the torch to somebody else. They were also much less charismatic, um, their faces less well known, less of a kind of aura associated with them uh, than Deng Xiaoping. And then under Hu Jintao in particular, some of the bold reforms associated with Deng Xiaoping had stalled. China had not been in a process of becoming um, more and more liberalized uh, so much under him, which was something that had happened under Deng Xiaoping. Um, there was also more and more of an attachment to kind of tradition and a focus on orderliness and stability above all else. And a vision began to emerge of China as a country that was surging forward to become modern, 
but in touch with its traditional values. So the question became, when Xi Jinping took power, would he restart stalled economic processes and be more like Deng, or would he be a kind of stay the course um, conservative figure like Hu Jintao? That was the state of play with the kind of argument about elements of the past when Xi Jinping took power in 2013, but then things began to shift. And I noticed this when I started going back to China during this period when I went there, and I started noticing Xi Jinping's face everywhere and his book in the bookstores. Things that um, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao's collections of speeches had been published, but not until after they had stepped down. Xi Jinping, you began to see uh, his book everywhere, and you began to see his face everywhere. Things that seemed to be more reminiscent in some ways of the Mao era um, than of the reform era. And so the question began to be, was he going back to something like that? And there also began to be a sense that with his uh, accumulation of power, and he took on more and more titles, perhaps he was even like a new emperor. And so a discussion began to go, rather than saying, was she um, a rebooting of Deng Xiaoping or just another Hu Jintao, was he actually perhaps a new emperor or a new Mao? Or another thing that was brought up, was he perhaps China's answer to Putin? Um, because Putin um, was staying in power, and Xi Jinping, this took on particular resonance when it was announced earlier this year that Xi Jinping would not step down after 10 years, but would rather continue on beyond there. And so then this became a, a set of three different things, especially after the term limits were announced. Was Xi Jinping a new emperor? Was he a new Mao? Or was he a Chinese answer to Putin? And in a kind of um, in in this kind of setting on the Chinese internet, these were all seen as dangerous things to be discussed. The Communist Party likes to control historical analogies as well as other things. Likes to control comparisons. You couldn't talk about Xi Jinping. The term limit end was announced as being either a new emperor, a new Mao, or a new Putin. But there were ways in which clever people uh, got around this. One of the ways they got around this was uh, tradition had developed among savvy internet users to refer to Xi Jinping if you wanted to criticize him, to compare him to Winnie the Pooh of all people. Xi Jinping is a bit portly, just like the famous bear of childhood literature. And the idea of him being like Winnie the Pooh began to circulate in 2013 after um, a meeting that Xi Jinping had with Obama. The tall Obama was portrayed as Tigger. Uh, while Xi Jinping was portrayed as Pu. But then it really took off when Xi Jinping met with um, the Japanese leader Abe. Neither of them looked happy to see the other one, so a meme went around on the internet showing Abe as Eeyore and Xi as Pu. So when term limit ends were announced and people started thinking about how Xi Jinping was taking on um, imperial trappings and might stay on forever, as emperors tended to be, or at least until they, um, they stepped down for a successor of their own volition, there began to be things on the web that showed Winnie the Pooh wearing a crown, until the censors, of course, began to sweep those away. Now, in a soundbite-driven op-ed um, kind of environment, what tends to get people's attention is if you say one parallel or one analogy, one comparison, unlocks everything about a situation. One year is just like an earlier year. One leader is just like a different leader of the past or of another country. And so there were calls for, think of Xi Jinping as an emperor, think of him as a Mao, think of him as a Putin. And then there would be responses that said, but actually there are problems with that. If you take it too seriously, there are problems. So a critique, for example, of um, seeing Xi Jinping as Putin plus is that Putin may game the electoral systems, but there is a popular election of sorts, even if the odds are stacked in his favor in Russia, whereas in China, there's not. Putin is not part of a large party apparatus. Xi Jinping is very much uh, a creature of the Chinese Communist Party. So the problem is that any of these, if you push too hard, uh, begin to fall apart. There's also something curious about, at least for a historically minded person, about seeing these ideas of uh, Xi Jinping as a new emperor coming out and also of comparisons between the man in Beijing and the man in Moscow being so similar. They harken back to an earlier period. There's a tendency uh, that we often fall into outside of China of thinking that China never really changes. And if China never really changes, then each new leader that's powerful is like a new emperor. This was said about Mao and was even said about Deng Xiaoping. And going along with that idea that China never changes is the idea that China changes completely at a certain moment. 
1949 was seen as one of those periods of complete transition. And then the idea was the person that you should compare China's leader to is the leader of the other big Communist Party run country of that time. So it was an idea that before there were talks of Xi Jinping and Putin, there was talk of Mao and Stalin. So there are ways to pick apart all of these. And I think you should be suspicious of new analogies that seem too much to fit into a very well-worn um, patterns from the past. And there are ways of thinking, though, that I want to get out of this idea of finding a perfect fix for um, thinking about Xi Jinping, try to open ourselves up to there being multiple things that partly work, even if they partly don't work. And here, I like a phrase that's attributed to Mark Twain, um, though like many sayings attributed to him, he probably didn't say it, which is he's allegedly said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. I like this idea because history doesn't repeat itself. Every stage in history is different. So while it's useful to think of parallels to the past, thinking of repetition thinks of a complete parallel. Instead, we should think of it rhyming. Rhymes uh, open you up to multiple things. Most words have more than one rhyme. When you say that ball rhymes with fall, you're not precluding it also rhyming with wall. So if you say that one moment in the past echoes or has something to tell us about the present, you're not saying that's the only place to look. You're just saying it's one of the places to look. The other idea is what I refer to as imperfect analogies. To take a comparison that seems a bit out there, but say, even though it seems on the surface as though this wouldn't work, look at what we can learn from seeing how much these two things that seem dissimilar actually have in common. Nobody would say that there's only one per imperfect analogy for um, a period or a leader, there are bound to be multiple ones. So the imperfect analogy and the period of Chinese history that I think rhymes with the present that I want to explore at the end of this talk is that was Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek was a strongman leader who was in charge of China um, before the 1949 revolution that brought Mao to power. Chiang Kai-shek was a diehard anti-communist. So he's not, he's obviously going to be an imperfect figure to compare to Xi Jinping, who heads the Chinese Communist Party. So it's an imperfect analogy. It's something that is counterintuitive in some ways. And I don't think it explains everything about Xi Jinping. But I think adding it to the mix as another period in the past that rhymes, the period before 1949, but after the time of emperors, can be useful. And thinking of this imperfect analogy with Chiang Kai-shek, along with others, can be useful. So what's the basis of this? There has to be something um, that makes the analogy seem to make sense. And one of the analogies is that Chiang Kai-shek led a revolutionary party, the Nationalist Party, which was anti-communist, but did see itself as connected, as having uh, connected to a revolution, in that case, the 1911 revolution. In Xi Jinping's case, he's continuing the spirit of the 1949 revolution, he said. Uh, Xi Jinping says that he's continuing the tradition of Mao, um, a figure, um, a founding figure. Chiang Kai-shek was continuing in the tradition, he said, of Sun Yat-sen, the founding figure of the Republic of China. Xi Jinping is breaking with some things from Mao. For example, he breaks with Mao. Mao would be horrified by Xi Jinping quoting Confucius as a great sage, because Mao thought of Confucius as a feudal figure who was holding China backward. Um, Sun, Chiang Kai-shek was breaking with a key thing about Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen said the Nationalist Party should collaborate with the Communist Party, but Chiang Kai-shek uh, wanted to exterminate the Communist Party. Something the two have in common is that they said that they wanted China to be modern, but they also wanted to be in touch with its traditional values. And Chiang Kai-shek raised Confucius up to the status of a kind of national saint, and Xi Jinping is continuing the process of raising Confucius back to that status after the period when he was vilified under Mao. Another thing the two have in common is that they both have stylish wives who accompany them on some diplomatic missions and um, are hits on, on the diplomatic scene. It sometimes was said that Xi Jinping, having Peng Liyuan, his wife, play the kind of first lady role that his predecessors, Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin's wife, hadn't played, meant that Peng Liyuan was China's first first lady. But actually, Chiang Kai-shek's wife, uh, Song Meiling, was in many ways playing a first lady role before that. Another similarity between the two is Xi Jinping keeps accumulating more and more titles to the point that Jeremy Barmay, 
um, a leading um, China specialist, says we should just call him the chairman of everything. Hu Jintao, Jiang Zemin, uh, before Xi Jinping, were, chair were head of the Communist Party, were president of the country, and were head of the main military commission. But Xi Jinping has added title after title after title of that, including being the first um, Chinese Communist Party leader to say that people should refer to him as the commander in chief. Chiang Kai-shek similarly had more and more titles to the point that in Thunder Out of China, one of the um, leading bestsellers on China in America in the late 1940s uh, by Theodore White and Anna Lee Jacobi said that you should just, you couldn't keep track of how many titles Chiang Kai-shek had. Nobody thought of that. So one of the things is, so we should think about this along with the other parallels and the other rhyming periods. So here's one to keep in mind and to think about that also draws into attention um, the idea of looking between the imperial period of dynasties and the Mao era. An image of Xi Jinping after he was granted the right to stay on in power past 10 years that circulated by a cartoonist operating outside of China, of course, showed Xi Jinping's face where Mao's face has been since 1949, but wearing imperial regalia, which, is the, which suggests that he's like an emperor so think back more than 100 years, but he's like Mao, think back about 50 years. This would seem to leave out the period uh, in between imperial rule and Mao's rule when Chiang Kai-shek was in power. But this, even though the image of Mao, uh, this portrait is often seen to show this is what changed in 1949. Before 1949, Chiang Kai-shek's face was in that same uh, spot for a while. And though Chiang Kai-shek did not have as developed a personality cult as Mao, he also had a personality cult and was venerated in some ways the same way. So for more on all of this, you can see Mara Cunningham in my book, the new edition, China in the 21st Century, What Everyone Needs to Know, uh, that came out, it was completed before Xi Jinping was granted the ability to rule on and on. But all of the things that I've mentioned that connect him with Chiang Kai-shek and all of the analogies, the idea of him as a new emperor, a new Mao, so a figure similar to Putin, were starting to be in the air. So check it out for more on anything I've brought up.